All right, so today we are going to be discussing mitosis versus meiosis, which is why you have the Punnett square. I'm sorry, not the Punnett square, the Venn diagram. We're going to look at that in just a second. We're also going to discuss genetics and heredity, um, kind of getting into the things that you had a little pretest on. And um, your homework, you will have a homework assignment titled More Punnett Square Review, which is going to be very simple. You, most, you probably will finish it in class today. And I want you to bring in a picture of yourself. When I, um, when I say a picture of yourself, um, let it be one within the past two years. Um, in this saying this also, do not go in your parents' living room and take a picture down that you don't want hanging up anymore and say, I'm taking this down, I'm going to hang this up and bring it in because it's a picture that I need you to bring in that you're not going to get back. Listen, if you have a, a picture that you can bring in that you're not going to get back, please bring it in. Now, if you do not have a, 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 pic, a physical picture because I need, a, I need it to be physical, that you're not going to get back, then you can email me a picture and I'll print a color copy for you. All right? But I really need it to be a picture, not one this small. It needs to be the, at least the size of like picture that you get printed from like the index card. Again, uh, my school email. Email it to my school email. If you do not have a, a, a physical picture, then I'll get, I'll print it for you. In addition to that, um, it just need, it has to be a face picture, like a front facing picture. We take a selfie, nothing with your head turned, nothing when you're in action. It just has to be a face picture. So if you want to take a selfie of yourself today and just hurry up and shoot me an email to it, that's perfectly fine. We'll need it for uh, one of our lessons that we're going to do. All right. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at this Punnett. I'm sorry, I keep calling the Punnett square. My bad. This um, Venn diagram. And let's fill in these blanks. We're going to go back and forth between mitosis and meiosis so you can see the differences as well as the comparisons. So looking, mitosis makes, nope, uh, Makayla, uh, no, nope. mitosis does not make specialized cells. Oh, yeah. Body. Who said that, Louis? Oh, no, he did it. It was Kyle. Over here, Kyle, go ahead. Uh, mitosis makes body cells, all cells of your body. So, meiosis makes what types of cells? But that goes somewhere else. Sex cells, because the reason why sex cells goes there, because underneath you have blank and blank, sperm and egg. All right, hopping back over to mitosis. Mitosis uh, makes cells with blank of the DNA. How much of the DNA does it use? All of the DNA. Looking back at meiosis just for a second, because we should have covered this right after we said sperm and egg, um, meiosis allows for what type of reproduction? Sexual. Sexual reproduction. And the DNA divides how many times? Two. Two times. With meiosis, um, it makes cells with half of the... Oh. Half of parent cell. The parent cell is the initial shell, cell that it's dividing from. It only makes um, a cell with half of that um, half of that parent cell. So looking back at, um, let's stay with meiosis for a moment. It, the fact that it makes cells with, well, no, I apologize. Let me backtrack. Let's go back to mitosis. Mitosis makes cells with all of the DNA. Therefore, humans have 46 chromosomes. 23 pairs. A pea plant only has 14 chromosomes. How many pairs? Seven. Seven pairs. Very good. Meiosis makes cells with half of the parent cell. Humans, in this instance, for meiosis, only has how many chromosomes? 46. Again, you need to listen because you're not, you're showing me that you're not comprehending what you're reading. In mitosis, the cells use all of the DNA. 
So there's 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs. In meiosis, it uses half of the parent cell. So there is 23. In a pea plant, there's going to be how many? Seven. A pea plant is the peas that you eat. You know the peas, the green peas? That's a pea plant. I'm reading exactly what's on your paper, Jamaica. All right, let's go back over to mitosis. Looking at the example, it says mitosis, the human example. This picture is showing you cells. The circle is the cells. The numbers are the number of chromosomes. So looking at mitosis, right here, the first one is a cell with 46 chromosomes. Remember, during interphase, what happens? Uh, it, grows. it grows, and what else? You're right. What happens with the DNA? DNA is copied. So when it's doing that, that growing of it, there's going to be a copy of the DNA. That's why it has 92. And then it splits to two more cells, which you have here. And how many chromosomes do they have? 46, 46 apiece. Where does this happen in all parts of the body and in all tissue? But now let's look at meiosis over here. Again, these circles are the cells, the numbers are the chromosomes. Again, it starts off with the parent cell that has 46. Meiosis does go through interphase. What happens during interphase? DNA is copied. Here's the 92. It goes through the process of mitosis. Well, it shares the same processes of mitosis, but it does it how many times? Twice. Twice. So here you have these two cells. They're copied. They have the 46 chromosomes, but then it happens again, ending with four cells with how many chromosomes? 23 apiece. And this happens in what type of tissue? You only have sperm and egg, and those types of cells are specialized. Any questions for that? All right. Then you have a note sheet that I came around and passed out to you titled Genetics and Heredity. We are going to go ahead and go over those notes. But you're going to watch a short video. While you're watching the video, you are going to fill in these blanks. But Okay. Take a moment and look over the note sheet first because there are some areas that you will be able to fill in the blanks on your own first. Just for genetics, look at genetics, because that's what we're going to start first. Short plants with tall plants, he noticed that only tall plants were produced. 
whatever produced these short plants seemed to disappear. Mendel called that tall height trait the dominant factor because it dominated or covered up the short height one. He called the short height trait the recessive factor. By the second generation of pea plants, those recessive short plant forms cropped up again. After tons of research, Mendel was able to predict that, on average, one out of every four pea plants would be short. Each plant has two genes that determine height. The tall gene, represented here by a capital T, is dominant, which means it only takes one of these genes to make a plant tall. It takes two short genes, represented by a lowercase t, to make a plant short. In the 19th century, a British geneticist named Reginald Punnett also experimented with peas and developed something called the Punnett square. Among other things, this Punnett square lets you predict the likelihood of what you would get if you crossed a tall plant with a short plant. An offspring gets one gene from each parent, either a tall or a short gene. Each plant produced by these two plants will be tall because each one has one of those dominant tall genes. But what happens if two of these new plants produce offspring? There are lots of ways this could turn out, but the most likely result is that we get three tall plants and one short one. Mendel only figured this stuff out after carefully studying 30,000 individual pea plants over an eight-year period. Well, I guess it's pretty reasonable to assume that he had peas for dinner every night. I think you're missing the point. All right, I didn't realize that I went ahead and did heredity first, but that's fine. Did you all pick that up? No. That it was heredity first? No. Yeah. Okay, if you didn't, that's okay. We're still going to cover it. I'm going to quickly just play the video for genetics now. Um, so look at the genetics portion because we will still go over it. And then we'll go over all of this information. This portion goes directly to the genetics portion of your notes. I don't know. Maybe the father was a tabby. Dear Tim and Moby, both my parents have brown eyes and I have blue eyes. How can that happen? From Emily P. Well, this is just a guess, but I'll bet one of your grandparents has blue eyes. Stop that. The color of your eyes is a factor of heredity, the passing down of physical traits from parents to children. That includes things like hair type, eye color, bone structure, and even parts of your personality. These traits are carried in our genes. Genes are made up of DNA, which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA is arranged in pairs of strands called chromosomes. In humans, there are 23 pairs of chromosomes in each cell. That's 46 chromosomes in all. Just about every cell in your body has these 46 chromosomes in it. You can think of them as a computer program for your body. Because everybody's different, no two sets of DNA are alike. You get your genes from your parents, 23 chromosomes from your mother, and 23 chromosomes from your father. Your parents got their genes from their parents, and so on. The genes from your parents combine to form your genes. Organisms that reproduce sexually, like people, have special cells just for making offspring. In animals, male sex cells are called sperm, and female sex cells are eggs. Sex cells are special because they have only a half set of genes. If your mother has brown eyes and your father has blue eyes, the chances are your eyes will be brown. This is because the genes that code for blue eyes are recessive and the genes that code for brown eyes are dominant. That means that in most cases, the gene for brown eyes will block out the gene for blue eyes. You still have the blue-eyed genes in your DNA, they're just not expressing themselves. By the same logic, two parents with brown eyes might be carrying recessive blue-eyed genes. If a sperm containing this recessive gene comes together with an egg containing the recessive gene, the brown-eyed parents can make a blue-eyed baby. Really? Huh. Well, I guess you're right. 
Moby says that the genetic process that determines your eye color is a little bit more complicated than this. It actually involves several genes, not just one. But it's a good example of how traits are passed down from generation to generation. Of course, it's important to remember that genes don't determine everything. What we look like is largely determined by the genes we inherit, but factors like environment and nutrition can play a role too. For example, modern humans are taller on average than our ancestors because of better nutrition. But it's hard to overestimate how much our genes shape who we are. Are my parents nerds? Well, my dad, um, why do you ask? All right. Let's go ahead and take a look at these notes here. So looking at genetics, what is the passing down of physical traits from parents to children? Heredity. Heredity. Notice this was on the pretest that you took and some of you put DNA, but it's not DNA, it's heredity. All right, this would be an example like your type of hair. Type of hair meaning is it curly, is it straight, um, is it thin, is it thick, is it coarse, things of that nature, the texture of it, the color of it, all of that type of stuff. Also, your eye color. What color are your eyes, obviously? The height. Are you normally, are you a tall person? Are you a short person? Are you, are you stopping at an average height? Um, mm -hmm. That comes from your, you inherited that from your parents. Your bone structure. Bone structure would be your, like your facial and your, your, your stockiness of your body, your built um, of your body. That is all, um, stop being a creeper. Yes. That is all comes from, that all comes from you, things that you inherit from your parents and even your personality. I'm not sure if that's inherited or if it's a choice, it's Isaiah. Um, but your personality, that comes from your parents. Sometimes we get parents that come in for parent conferences and they're like, I don't know where my child got that from. You're like, really? Um, but yeah. Sweet personalities, maybe if you're a really sweet person and you inherit that from your parents. All right, heredity traits are carried in your genes, genes not your Levi's, but your G-E-N-E-S. And what is made up of deoxyribonucleic acid? Uh, genes. And DNA is arranged in pairs of strands of chromosomes. Humans have how many pairs? Very good. And, um, how many total? 46. 46. What is two pairs called? Two pairs of chromosomes. Tetrad. Good. All right. Yes, it was on your notes. It was on your homework yesterday, and I came around and they said it to everyone. I said it in class, too. All right. Um, everyone is different, so no two sets of DNA is alike except for identical twins. Are the Livingston twins identical? No. Okay. Two types of genes. You have a recessive, recessive and a dominant. dominant. Now these things mean recessive means the one that's going to take a recess. That's the one that's not going to show. The dominant one is the one that is going to show. It doesn't mean that the dominant gene is better or more powerful um, in nature, meaning that if you are someone that demonstrates a recessive gene, as opposed to someone that demonstrates a dominant gene, that doesn't mean you're better than that person. Because from history, people have thought that back in history. All right? Um, in most cases, the which gene will block out the? Very good. So how could it be a child born with brown hair if both of their parents are naturally black hair? Kyle. Um, someone down there, his or her family tree, had, um, nope, that is true, but still, talking about those parents, talking about those genes, those traits that they have, Latavia. Um, brown hair is the, the dominant gene. No, it can't be the dominant gene because if it was, that child would have had it. The recessive. the recessive. So, what what, what do you tell me about their parents? That they have brown hair. No, they don't. It says they have naturally. They have, they have black hair, but they're just they have a recessive brown hair trait that the child inherited. This explains why you could say, I don't quite look like my mom or my dad, but I look just like my grandmother. Why is it so that you would look like your grandmother, but maybe not favor your mom or dad so much? Is it because your grandmother is your real mother? No. No, so why, tell me why. Why, how is it possible 
that you could look just like your grandmother or look just like your grandfather, but not really look just like your mother and father. Where did you get your genes from? 23 from your mom and 23 from your dad, right? Where'd they get theirs from? 23 from their mom and 23 from their dad. Therefore, some of those genes that you got are some of the genes from your grandparents. Do you understand? Then why you were sitting here looking at me like I'm crazy? All right. What are other factors that determine our genetic makeup, meaning what we look like? Um, nutrition. nutrition and the environment. For instance, if you are someone that has been living maybe in a warm climate area all your life where there's a lot of sun, then chances are your skin tone is not going to be a pale skin tone. You're going to have a darker skin tone. If you are someone that uh, lived in an area where nutrition was not readily available, that's somewhere you grew up and that's somewhere that you still live, then you're not going to have all these different body types and structures. You're going to be more on the thin side because that nutrition's not there. Like us Americans, we have all these shapes and sizes because we have so much food readily available to us. But if we go to a third world country or a country that does not put a lot of indulgence in junk food and sweets, they don't have these different body shapes and sizes. Understand? All right, moving on to heredity, since we did already watch the video. For heredity, things that are inherited, it is something that is passed down from your parents or for, to an offspring. Um, who is the monk that used these pea plants? Gregor Mendel, M-E-N-D-E-L-L. -L. You will need to know his last name. If I mention him, you will need to know what he's responsible for. M-E-N-D-E-L-L. -L. Gregor. G-R-E-G-O-R. -E All right, we're done. Moving down. He is the one that studied the pea plant so we can understand these different traits. What he is responsible for, he is responsible for coining the term recessive and dominant. When I say coining, it doesn't mean he came up with these words. These words already existed. It just means that he used these words to describe traits. Just like Robert Hooke used the word cell to describe our cells. For example, a description for a dominant tau gene would be represented by a capital letter. Or in this case, the tau gene would be represented by a capital T. The capital letter is your dominant gene or dominant trait. And the recessive short gene would be represented by a lowercase letter. And because we're talking about short as opposed to tall, it's going to be a lowercase t. And I'm right here on the notes. Now I'm here. It only takes one of the dominant genes. to make an organism tall or have the dominant. And what that means is if the dominant gene is present, the organism will display that trait. You might want to write that down somewhere. If the dominant gene is present, you might want to write this down on your notes, the organism will display that gene. So there is no way that you can have the dominant trait and not have the dominant, I'm sorry, have the dominant gene and not have the dominant trait. Does that make sense? Okay. So looking at the italicized words, if it if dominant T, recessive T, that's how you say it, was your gene pair, would you be tall or short? Tall. tall because the dominant gene is present. Do you understand? All right. Who was responsible for developing the Punnett square? Punnett. Reginald Punnett. You will need to know what he was responsible for. His last name tells it all. But the Punnett square helps us to predict uh, what will happen when we cross um, dominant genes with recessive genes. So it helps us to understand, all right, if we know the genotypes um, and the phenotypes, then we can probably predict what the offsprings are going to be like. So for example, Looking at this Punnett square, we are taking a tall plant that is dominant, dominant. See the capital T's? Mm -hmm. We're crossing it with the short plant that is recessive, recessive. When we do that, we plug it into the Punnett square and we fill out each box by cross-referencing. 
So you have dominant recessive, dominant recessive, dominant recessive, and dominant recessive. What will all of the offspring be? Tall. Tall. Because again, if the dominant trait is there, it's going to have be the, if the dominant gene, I keep saying trait, is there, it's going to have the dominant trait. Going to the back. Number two, we're taking a tall plant that has the geno pair dominant recessive, but it is tall because why? The dominant gene is there. Good. We're crossing it with another plant that has a dominant recessive geno pair. When we look at that, we are putting it in our Punnett square and we come out with this possibility. If you remember, this is the same. Uh, Punnett square that we had when we looked at our two brown rats that ended up with an albino rat. Uh -huh. When we looked at that, we saw that both parents had a dominant trait, but a recessive. This would explain why maybe both of your parents have black hair, but you have brown. This would be you. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's the possibility. So could cross rep crossing these two types of plants produce a short offspring? Yeah. Yes. What's the percentage? 25%. 25 it's one out of four. Oh. So if these parents were coming together and say, what's the possibility that our child will have, will be short, it's a 25% chance that we will have a short child. All right? I mean, if you know your genotypes, Janae. So like, you know with uh, little people, yeah. so with genes, yeah. Yes. All right, looking at number three, what you're going to do, I'm going to switch my screen. No. All right, so looking at the screen here, it says a red flower with the dominant recessive is crossed with a white flower, which is recessive R, recessive R. What you do on your Punnett square, the first thing you do, you look at one of the parents and you uh, populate that on your Punnett square. So you have a capital R and a lowercase r. That's one parent. You take the other parent, you place it on the other side. You have recessive r, recessive r. Let me fix that because it's too far over. All right. And then we cross reference them. So we look at it and we say, my screen is backwards here. You have a capital R. You can't just say RR. You have to say dominant R, recessive R. And then you have over here, recessive, recessive. Here you have dominant, recessive. The dominant always goes first. Recessive, recessive. My screen is a little bit different than yours on here. That's why I'm, it's taking me to write it correct. Don't worry about it. Baby crying. It's okay. All right. So when we cross this, what's the possibility of having a white flower? 50%. Possibility of having a red flower. 50%. Very good. Let's look at number four. We have a white flower with a white flower. 50 50, yep. So white is recessive gene. So here you have a white flower, crossing it with a, another white flower. What's the percentage of having any other color? Zero. All the flowers are going to be. All the flowers are going to be what color, though? White, because they all have the recessive trait. Any questions on that? All right? Yes. Huh? The seeds germinate. All right. Then... If the two parents have all dominant, you don't need to write this, but if the two parents are all dominant, uh-oh, sorry, didn't mean to put that there. What's the percentage that you'll have, in, that any of the offspring will have a recessive trait? Zero. Zero. The percent, all of the offspring are going to carry the exact trait 
that this parent has. All right, I'm going to pass out your homework to you so that we can um, understand it to get started on it. No, you can't do anything yet. Just keep your hand down. Just hold on for a second. He was booby but yeah. All right, when you look at this homework, it is called More Punnett Square Practice. It's very simple. It's doing exactly what we're doing in class, but I need to um, make sure that you understand and you understand the terminology that's on there. So please don't talk while I'm talking right now. When you look on it, it says a Punnett square helps scientists predict the possible genotypes and phenotypes. Underline those two words. It is smaller because I had to try to print it all on one paper so that you didn't have extra papers. Yes. Shh. Come get one from up here, please. Yes. All right. And then it says when uh, it's looking, the scientists look to see the possibilities of the genotypes and the phenotypes when offspring, when they know the um, this information about the parent, so they can predict it of the offspring. The phenotype is a physical appearance of an organism. Underline that and circle the word phenotype. This is the definition of phenotype. Phenotype, again, is the physical appearance. Short, tall, brown hair, black hair, blue eyes. The genotype is the inherited combination alias. Underline all of that. Circle genotype and alias. Alias, the word alias that's on there. Or underline. All right. The genotype is the pairing of the letters dominant recessive the alias are the are the letters b t s those types of things this skill uh this sheet is going to help you develop the skill of how this works so if you look at the example you have b being used as the alias dominant capital b recessive lowercase b the capital b is going to represent black fur the lowercase b is representing white fur here they filled out the punnett square it shows the genotype possibility is dominant, dominant B. Another possibility is dominant recessive B. Do you see that? Then it tells you the phenotype. Dominant B, dominant B is the phenotype black fur. Dominant B, recessive B is the phenotype black fur because whenever there is a dominant trait or dominant gene, it's going to carry the, the trait. Good. And then it looks at the chance. There's 50% chance of each of these. Any questions for that? No. All right, then let's look at the example for your homework. So in a cabbage butterfly, white wings are dominant to yellow wings. If a dominant recessive butterfly is crossed with a recessive recessive butterfly, what are the possible genotypes and phenotypes of the offspring? So when we look here, you have to be very careful when you're writing your letter. Some of you have some characteristic um, writing where it's not, you can't tell if it's a capital letter or a lowercase letter. Here you have to be very deliberate. So what would be the genotype pairing here? Don't say WW. Dominant W. Uh oh, you can't see that. And recessive W. You can try to write that small. All right, then on the next, right over here on this side, what would it be? Recessive, recessive. 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 Then you would have over here what? Dominant, recessive. recessive. What about here? Recessive recessive. recessive, recessive. So when you come down here, what would be one genotype? No. Dominant, dominant, recessive. What would be another possibility of a genotype? Recessive, recessive, recessive. Dominant recessive is what phenotype? Um, white, white, white wings. White wings. Yeah, 
Recessive, recessive would be what color wings? Yellow. Yellow. What is the chance of their offspring having the genotype dominant recessive with white wings? 50%. 50%. What is the chance of their offspring having recessive genes with yellow? 50%. Do you see how you're doing your homework? Yes. All right, before you get started, the number three, they're out of order, but if you look at actual number three, there is only one genotype with one phenotype. I know I put two boxes there, but there's only one. All right? So cross off that second box. Isaiah, don't erase on my table. All right, this concludes the lesson. Please do not forget to send me a picture if you don't have a physical one or bring a picture in.